It was Marvin Zindler, the great anchor here at Channel 13 in Houston, Texas, that said, it is hell being broke. 2003, uh, I filed Chapter 13. Uh, bankruptcy, we were overrun with debt. Um, we were on WIC, Women, Infant, and Children. We were on food stamps. Uh, early on in our marriage, we had four very, very small kids. Uh, I was working 50, 60 hours a week. So if you're working and you get paid on a Friday and you are broke by Saturday, because all of your finances have gone, gone to pay bills, and that's how you've been living your life for the majority of your life, listen to me. Tired and burnout is on its way. If you spend all of your years chasing this, 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 this elusive thing called money, um, it's going to burn you out and you're going to miss some of the prime moments of your life. All right, family, welcome to Studio B. I am your host, Pastor MDH. Thank you so, so very much for joining us here on the set today. I greatly appreciate your viewership and your followership today. Today, 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 we're not going to do anything political. We're not going to do anything social. We're not going to do any of that stuff. I'm going to talk about something that is on the hearts and minds of every single person. Uh, something that I have become very, very passionate about uh, in the educational sense of being passionate about it um, so that I can get very well at it. And that is money. Money, 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 money. It was the great Biggie Smalls that said, more money, more problems. I think a lot of people wish that they had more money so that they can get those more problems. But I want to share with you today some stuff that you need to know about your money. It was Marvin Zindler, the great anchor here at Channel 13 in Houston, Texas, that said it is hell being broke um, and nobody wants to be broke. So I think it's high time that we understand how to manage money, not to work for money, but have your money work for you. So just a little preview of what this, where this is going. Uh, I am 48 years old. I'll be 49 this year. I did not learn basic money management, serious money management until I was around 33 years old. Um, I, like many of you, grew up in a house where money management just was not taught. It was not set down and discussed at the table. Uh, did not know how to manage a checkbook, didn't know the difference between a debit card and a credit card, didn't know how to save, didn't know how to do any of that because it just not it was just not talked about uh, in my house. I saw my mom going to work and working hard all the days of my life. My mom working one job, two jobs. So it was a um, it was a working environment that I grew up in. Um, we were lower middle class for the majority of my life. Uh, but I've never been sat down and talked about with the basics of money. So like you, I was told to go get a job, work hard, make sure that your bills are paid, put food on the table, so on and so forth. And that's how many people have been raised, that you go and you work hard for your money. Um, but that is a flaw. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot give that which you do not have. So that generational knowledge that is passed down from generation, it can't be passed down, first of all, if the knowledge is not there. Uh, what I've come to learn in my own life is that it's never about money. Money is not your issue. It is your education about money that is the issue. Money is never, ever the issue. It is not about you having a lack of money, which is contributing to these particular causes in your life. It is because you are not educated about money and that's what's leading to all of these things in your life. It is the education about money, not money itself. So many of you have heard my story. I've been very upfront, very open, taking the aha moments away uh, from everybody. In 2003, uh, I filed chapter 13, uh, bankruptcy. We were overrun with debt. 
Um, there was no end in sight. I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so we filed chapter 13 bankruptcy uh, by God's grace, by God's mercy. We paid that off and completed that program in 2008. Um, we were on WIC, Women, Infant, and Children. We were on food stamps uh, early on in our marriage. We had four very, very small kids. Uh, I was working 50, 60 hours a week. Um, my wife was a stay-at-home mom for the first seven years of our marriage, eight years of our marriage. Um, and so money was just super, 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 super tight. And unfortunately, I was not educated enough by anybody around me to know what to do with the $70,000 that I was making a year, uh, which was a very good salary in 2003. I was making $70,000 a year. Um, but I had nobody to tell me what to do with that $70,000 a year. Now, I had plenty of Christian folk who were well-meaning uh, telling me that I just needed to tithe on my money. Just tithe. Make sure that you tithe, which I did, and I did consistently. Um, I've been tithing unto the Lord since 1999. Uh, tithing has never been an issue or a struggle for me. Um, but as I shared many times, tithing alone will not get you to a place of financial freedom. You need tithing plus discipline plus a plan. And this is stuff that we don't talk about, especially within our context about money. Now, let me just kind of break down some walls here. Talking about finances to the average person is very personal. Um, and there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of all of these things that come along with money, because as you get to the older generation, you will hear them say things like, well, I should be farther along than where I'm at. You know, I'm 50, I'm 60. I got a thousand dollars saved up in the bank. So one good um, medical emergency will break me. You know, if the engine busts, it will break me. You know, these are where a lot of people are in life. And so talking about money is something that is very, very personal to a lot of people. And there's a lot of um, uh, overcast when you're talking about money. So what I want to do, first of all, is trying to take down the stigma of this thing called money, okay? We haven't been taught well about money, and that's where we need to change uh, the paradigm. We need to break the generational curse um, in regards to money. Because while we are playing checkers, other people are playing chess. And they're playing chess because they have the education about money in order to make money work for them and not spend every waking day of their lives working for money. So if you're working and you get paid on a Friday and you are broke by Saturday because all of your finances have gone, gone to pay bills and that's how you've been living your life for the majority of your life. Listen to me, tired and burnout is on its way. Uh, because you can only do that for so long. So here I am almost 49 years old, and I praise God um, for the information and the education that I've been able to attain about money, because money is one of these things when you understand the ebbs and flows of it, money begins to work for you and not you spending all of your time, energy, and effort missing your, your, your child's baseball game or their soccer game because you gotta put in overtime on the job and you can't be here, you can't go there because you don't have enough money to do a family vacation. You, you avoid going out to nice restaurants or wherever it may be because you don't have the financial support to undergird that. Well, that becomes tiresome. Um, that becomes tiresome because after you work, you should be able to enjoy some of the fruit of your labor. You should be able to enjoy some of that. But if you don't understand how money works and get educated about money, you're going to spend the rest of your life borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. And that's just a hell of a life to live. And I don't believe that that's what God wants us to do. And I don't believe that that's the life that God has called for us to live. The life that we have on earth is very, very short. It's, 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 you know, what James called a vapor of smoke. It's here one day and it's going the next. If you spend all of your years chasing this, 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 this elusive thing called money, um, it's going to burn you out and you're going to miss some of the prime moments of your life. So on today's podcast, I want to just talk about money. What is it? 
And it's going to be very, very practical stuff, stuff that I have learned, stuff that I have implemented in my own life. Now, I'm not rich by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not a millionaire, a billionaire or any such thing. But I can go to whatever restaurant that I want to go to. If we decide to go take a vacation, we can go there. If I want to go get this, I can go get that. Uh, God has been extremely good to me. However, um, all of that has come because of the knowledge of the word of God, but also about how I have educated myself about money. Listen to this. It takes money to be born. It takes money to die. And everywhere in between, every single day of your life, Something that you do is going to be associated with money, everything. And make no mistake about it. When you come out of your mother's womb, after they done wrapped you in the swaddling cloth and after they done gave you a name and signed the birth certificate, here comes the bill for that labor. When you breathe your last in a placed in that pine box and put six feet deep after they don't put all the dirt on top, here comes a bill for that funeral. It takes money to live, to be born. It takes money to die. And everywhere in between, money is going to be intertwined in all of your life. So a significant portion of your life will revolve around money. So your relationship with money has to do with how you understand it how you understand it. Money is not spiritual. Money is not non-spiritual. Money is just money. It's not the, it's not money. That is the root of all evil. It is the love of money, which is all, which is the root of all evil. Money is what we call a moral. It, it does nothing. Um, it doesn't accomplish anything. It means money takes on its significance depending on whose hand that it is in. And whatever that person does with the money is now there for good versus evil. But money in and of itself is not bad. So you need to understand money from the standpoint of how money works. Uh, what can I do with money? Understand this. Um, money in short is just simply a median of exchange. Now, I'm just going to go over here to this cul-de-sac. I'm going to ride around the cul-de-sac and I'm going to come back out on the main street. Here in America, we have this thing called capitalism. Capitalism is a wonderful system of government. Here's what capitalism means. Capitalism means that a person, any person, can have a, an idea about a good service, product, whatever it may be, market that goods or services to an individual. That person buys that good or services from that person, and both parties are mutually beneficially blessed. Right. So if I make this coffee mug, I have an audience that I can um, uh, advertise this to. That person buys this coffee mug. He gets a coffee mug. I get the money. We are both blessed. We are both mutually benefited because of a particular product. That is capitalism. Socialism says that everybody gets to draw from the same pot. So regardless of how much money that you put into it, regardless of how much work you put into it, everybody gets the same. That's why socialism sucks. Go ask Venezuela. Go ask Cuba. Communism says that there are an elite few at the top. And when I say few, I mean very few. And the few at the top dictate how everybody else gets paid. Capitalism is a wonderful system. And by, by, way, by the way, even though we got some economic times going on here right now in the United States, 7.9% inflation, high gas prices, uh, supply chain issues, because of capitalism, America will be okay. America will rebound. America will get back to a sense of normalcy. Inflation will go down. Gas prices will go down. Goods and services will go down because capitalism is the thing that drives the American economy. Now, with capitalism being understood, well, I need to also tell you about the middle class. The middle class is what makes America run, not the upper class, not the lower class. It's the middle class. It's the people in the middle. It's the people that's going to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. It's those people that keeps America moving. It's those people that I'm speaking to right now. Uh, those people that I'm speaking to right now, the people that are in the middle, the people that are not rich, but they're not poor. They're right there in the middle. 
Um, they got money. They got some. They got a couple of dollars in the bank. Uh, they're good. They're not starving. They're not hungry. They're not about to be kicked out on the street. However, there's some room for improvement. That's the main target people that I'm looking at because those are the people that make America run. So it is incumbent upon us to understand money. Now, to those parents out there, to those teachers out there, pastors out there, we cannot give what we do not know. So if you don't have the information, it's going to be difficult for you to pass that information down to your children. It's going to be difficult for you to pass that information down to your children's children when you do not have the information that you need. The Bible has over 2000 scriptures regarding money. As a matter of fact, of the 37 parables that Jesus spoke about, 19 of them had to do with money. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about hell. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about faith. Jesus talked about money because money was a very, very important commodity, even in Jesus day. And if it was an important commodity in Jesus day, some 2000 plus years ago, how much more is it important in our day? One of the most prolific scriptures that you will ever find is this. It's in Matthew chapter six, verse number 21. It says where your treasure is, there also is your heart. I can tell what you love by where you spend your money. Money is an indicator of the heart. So always hear this, always understand this. Your issue is not with money. Your issue is a heart issue, right? Because you don't understand it and you feed your heart and your, 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 your gratifications over what you know to be true. You get into a pit that eventually you can't get yourself out of. So money is a very, very big issue. And, and in the times that I've been talking about this, especially last night with the men and, and what I've been able to learn over these last 16 plus years, being in the financial services industry, understanding some of the ebbs and flows and having people that have a business and financial acumen come up to me and talk to me about these things and give me insight about what I previously did not have information about has been life transforming. And then I get to the place to where I say, man, I just didn't know that. I, I didn't know that you could do that. I didn't know that that program was available. So we got to educate ourselves about money. So if you are in a position right now where money is not working for you, stay tuned because you're going to hear some stuff that's going to bless you. Never chase money, chase your purpose. When you're walking in your person, you know, when you're walking in your purpose, money chases you. When you're outside of your purpose and your giftedness and your skill set, you'll always work for money. But when you are in your sweet spot, money chases you. And because I don't chase money, money chases me. I want you to hear that. You need to hear that. You need to hear that. Once you get in your sweet spot, that space where God has designed for you to be, all provisions for your life will be taken care of over and abundantly taken care of. It is not God's will that you are dodging bill collectors. It is not God's will that you are behind on payments. It is not God's will that you are getting ready to get your car repossessed or get your car, your, your house foreclosed on. It is not God's will that you only got $5 in your pocket. That's not God's will. God's will is that we be stewards of God's money. Now hear this. When you understand the principles of money, money will always come to you. Especially now I'm talking uh, primarily uh, here in our Western culture, uh, particularly in America, uh, because the money principles do not work the same in other parts of the world. Um, there are big issues in other parts of the world. Money is a, you know, is a primary sense of uh, source of income in, in most of the parts of the world. However, in America, we have a system where we cannot get uh, we can't be effective without it. So I'm talking primarily um, within a Western um, concept. Two things that I need you to hear. One, God owns everything. God owns absolutely everything. God owns absolutely everything. So what you need to do about money is change your perspective about money. God owns everything. 
He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All the silver and all the gold is his. When you understand that from a 30,000 foot view that God owns everything, you begin to start looking at money completely different. Two, money is a tool. Money is a tool. If I gave a hammer to a, um, if I gave a hammer to a painter, he wouldn't be a very effective painter. If I gave a paintbrush to a carpenter, he wouldn't be a very good carpenter. The tools of the trade matter. So a painter needs a paintbrush in order to paint effectively, right? Money is simply a tool. That, that, that is all that it is. It is a tool. It is something that I use to gain something that I need. It is a tool. OK, and when you understand that when you put the right tool in your hand, you can be effective in doing what God has called for you to do. You stop using a hammer if you are a painter. Money is a tool. Matthew 6 and 24. You can't serve two masters. You will either love one or hate the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. Money is simply a tool. That is all it is. Number three, you need to learn how to be content. Now, this is maybe a lesson that you learn later on in life. Uh, I am doing my best right now to God be the glory of trying to teach my kids the blessing of contentment and saying to yourself, you don't need everything that you want. You have to learn how to tell yourself no now in order to tell yourself yes later. Because I will not be a 60 year old Walmart greeter. Okay, once I retire, um, which in preaching terms, there's never gonna be a time that I retire, but I'm not gonna be working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week when I'm 75 years old. No, no, no. And once I put up my feet on my rocking chair and me and my lovely wife are now watching our grandkids and we're watching them all grow up and we're watching the fruit of our of our of our work. Uh, I'm not going to have to say, hey, babe, I got to get up and go to Walmart at two o'clock so that I can go get that shipped because the, the Social Security is not paying enough money for me. No, that's not. No, 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 no. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say no now in order to say yes later. So you got to learn how to be content. This is hard in America because we watch commercials and because we watch movies and because we got idols, we got movie stars and, and music people and they're driving the latest cars. They're wearing the latest fashion and they're doing this, that, and the other. And your flesh is saying, man, that sure would look good on you. You have to learn how to be content. I'm not telling you not to have nice things, but make sure you can afford nice things. You gotta learn how to be content. You gotta kill greed. You gotta learn how to kill greed. Uh, greed is uh, opulence. It is, um, I got 15 of these when I only need one. Uh, greed is something that will overwhelm your heart. And once greed gets into your heart, it is very difficult to dissect it out. Uh, greed is a parasite. So you have to learn how to kill greed in your heart. I'm going to talk about this a lot because this is one of the uh, things that I try to under try, try to get people to understand. Uh, you got to be mindful of debt. Uh, I told the men last night, you need to operate on the 70-30 principle. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but keep that in mind. 70-30 principle, which is something that I do uh, in my own life. 70-30 principle. I don't live off 100%. I live off of 70%. Okay. And it's a very important principle that you need to understand if you're trying to build wealth, if you're trying to put some stuff away, if you're trying to make a future for you, your family, and your well-being, you need to understand that principle of the 70 30 rule. Now, some people out there, some financial strategists got a 50 30 20 rule. Some got a 60 40 rule. Uh, Dave Ramsey has, uh, Dave Ramsey's got a 60 40 rule. For me personally, in my family, we do a 70 30. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you have to be mindful of debt. That four letter word. It's not a curse word. Um, but if you got too much of debt, it is a curse word. Not all debt is bad debt, okay? Credit card debt, bad debt. 
your vehicle debt, bad debt. Okay. You have two types of debt. You have an appreciating debt and you have depreciating debt. Okay. So not all debt is bad debt. Cars are depreciating debt. Whatever you buy that car for right now, today, you will never be able to get that same amount of money from. It's always depreciating. Right now, the value of when you drive off of a lot is gonna be around 18% of what your car is gonna lose its value. Your car is gonna lose almost 40% of its value in the first two years. Almost 40% of its value in the first two years of you owning that vehicle. You will never be able to get back the price that you paid, <coughs> excuse me, for that car. So you gotta be mindful of depreciating debt. Okay, be mindful of depreciating the uh, debt because the more depreciating debt you have, the less appreciating debt you have. Your, your, your mortgage is an appreciating debt, uh, which means that you can buy a house for this amount today and in 10 years, the same house, the exact same house, uh, minus any upgrades or things that you've done to the house, you can sell that for exponentially more than what you bought it for in the original purchasing price. That's what's called appreciating debt. But you need to understand something. You need to be aware of the pit of debt. You need to be aware of that. You got to stop having 15,000 credit cards. You need to, you, I'm not going to say throw away. We'll get to that in a second. But you need to have at max two credit cards. And you need to have credit cards that suit a particular purpose and a need. Don't just get a credit card. Get a credit card that is working for you. Okay, but you need to be mindful of debt. You need to be mindful of debt. Uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 12, the Lord will open up his good treasury in uh, the heavens to give you rain on your land and seasons and bless all the work of your hands and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Deuteronomy 28 and 12, that does not mean that God does not want you to borrow. Okay, that does not mean that. Uh, we're living and talking about this middle class again. There's not a lot of people when purchasing a home can scratch a $250,000 check and pay for the home all at once. Not many people can do that. Praise God if you're watching and you're one of those people who can do that. Praise God for it. But the majority of Americans cannot just scratch a check for a home. So what they have is uh, those who are trying to purchase a home that don't necessarily have Two hundred and fifty or three hundred thousand dollars. They have what's called a mortgage, a mortgage, and a mortgage is underwritten by a bank or a mortgage company. And that mortgage company says, "Come to me, give me money down. I will undergird um, the strength of your loan to the tune of whatever that house may be." I will undergird that amount and then you pay me back in monthly increments to pay off the value of your of your loan. That's called a mortgage. OK, a mortgage is a good engine for those who are looking to purchase homes. But but I need you to hear this. Mortgages were created for banks, not for homeowners. So let's just say, for instance, you buy a house for three hundred thousand dollars and you do a 30 year note on that on that mortgage of three hundred thousand dollars. And let's say you got a rate of about three percent. All right. Over the next 30 years, you're going to pay roughly about one point two million dollars for a three hundred thousand dollar house. OK, so I always know this, that mortgages, even though they're good, because a lot of people can't just scratch a three hundred thousand dollar check and buy the house all at once. Mortgage comes in, undergirds the, the, the strength of that loan and then allows you to pay them back in increments. OK, that's good for you, but it's better for them because they're going to make six hundred thousand dollars off of you over the next 30 years. Right. So you're going to pay for your house times three when you're done with a 30 year mortgage. Now I always say a 30 year mortgage is nothing bad about that. Um, your credit might not dictate you getting a 15 year mortgage. Um, so a 30 year mortgage is not bad, but there are ways to overcome spending a million dollars on a $300,000 house. Now you can get a 30 year mortgage and cut it down to 20 simply by paying an additional house note a year. 
or after five years, which is how I typically tell people, if you get a brand new house, stay in there for about five years or so, build up some good equity and then chop it down to a 15 year mortgage. You'll still be after the five years that you've been in there, plus now your 15 year mortgage right at a 20. But you're gonna go from paying a million dollars to paying about $550,000. So about a half a million dollars worth of savings. But a mortgage is good. A mortgage is good debt. Your home is good debt that can be allocated off to your taxes and and all of these type of benefits that your homestead exemptions and and all of the things that come along with owning a home. Home is good debt. Rent in an apartment or in a rental space is bad debt because you're not getting any return on that money. Okay, if you go in and get a rental place at an apartment and you don't pay your rent for one month, you can get kicked out. Okay, because you're not paying rent. You don't have any type of rights as a renter. Now you got basic rights as a renter, but you have the 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 apartment complex or whatever that landlord has ultimate rights over that particular property. You don't own anything. You don't own anything. The couches and the beds that you use to furnish your apartment are not sitting on your carpet. They're sitting on the apartment carpet. They're in the apartment space that you are simply renting out. Okay. Rent is bad debt because you're not receiving anything back from it. You can't write rent off. Well, you can in certain instances, but rent is a bad debt for the majority um, uh, of, of people. So you got to be mindful of debt. Okay. This is very important. Uh, the Bible says that a good name is worth more than precious rubies. Your name is worth something. You have to be careful about what you sign your name to. Okay. Please. You got to be careful about what you sign your name to. We're going to get to something in just a little bit because what I signed my name to, I have vowed to pay. I vowed to pay that. So I answer my phone. I tell people, you know, when I get my, I get my card out a lot. I get my card out to a lot of people, you know, everywhere that I go, I get my card out. And I tell people when I get my card, I say, listen, when you call me, I answer numbers that I don't know because I'm not dodging bill collectors. All right. So I answer my phone. If it's a number that I don't know, I'm not like, Oh, who, who is this? I'm going to answer the phone. Cause I know on the other side of that line, there's nobody that's chasing me down for money that I owe them. So you got to be careful about debt. Debt is bad. Now watch this. Debt is an extension of your Christianity. Debt is an extension of your Christianity. I told the men last night about an example of back in December of this year, um, I was a victim of credit card fraud. And so somebody had bought a $2,000 watch. They had done like $800 on Amazon. And so I called the credit card company uh, to tell them that this, this was not my purchase. And so the young lady on the other side, you know, she's asked me for my name. She asked me for my address and uh, I give her all that stuff. I give her, you know, the account number and all that. And she says, by the way, are you in Houston? I said, no, I'm in Missouri City. My, my home address is in Missouri City. She said, are you close to Houston? I said, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's just maybe about 15 minutes away from me. She said, um, you don't happen to go to the church of Bethel's family, do you? I said, yeah. She said, Pastor Holman? Now, the lady on the other side of the phone, who I'm calling about credit card fraud, recognizes my name and my voice and says, Pastor Holman, now watch this. Here's what I told the men. What if that same person is calling me because I owe them money? What does that do to my testimony? Watch this. As a pastor, then as a Christian. If I got people out there that I owe that I have not paid. That's debt. So be careful of debt. Debt is not your friend. If you're going to have debt, have good debt. Okay, have good debt. Put your money in places where you have good debt. At 49, at 48 going on 49, I've become uh, so streamlined in, in, in my living. I used to be a collector of watches. I used to have a lot of watches. I had at one time uh, 25 watches. I just, I, you know, I love watches. I would collect them like watches from, from, you know, uh, these are the watches that I'll just wear just to wear. And these are the, this is the watch that I'm aware on a very, very special occasion. Um, at one time it was 24 watches. 
I now have three. At 48, 49 years old, I have become very, very streamlined in my approach to life. It just doesn't take a lot for me uh, right now at this stage of my life. It, it just really doesn't. Um, so I, I've, I've figured out that, you know, the more that I put other people before me, the more God in turns blesses me. And then I've also figured out that it just does not take a lot. Uh, I am a homebody. I go to work and I go home. I don't do a lot of stuff out. Uh, so my life is like super, super, super simple. Um, I wouldn't be a hard man to assassinate if you were trying to find me. Okay, you just got to look two places. But I've done that because I understand, one, um, I'm, I'm approaching the later years of my life where I can't run as fast as I used to run, where I'm not as, you know, physically fit as I once was. And so I am now preparing for those days when I can sit back and relax and then have some stuff to show for 30, 40, and 50 years of working. You know, have some stuff that I can, you know, give to my grandkids and, you know, help my kids out in life. That's that's where I want to be now. You know, I want to be at a place to where I can bless them. And be, and by blessing them, it's not hurting me, right? So I'm, 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 I'm aiming in that direction now. And because I'm doing that, I've just figured out that it does not take a lot uh, to do. So I want to give you a couple things here. Uh, first of all, I need you to know how to manage your finances. You need to look at your finances and become the manager of your finances. You got to make a plan. And this is what I share with Christians who say, well, you know, I'm a faithful giver. I'm a tither. Praise God for that. Uh, in my first year of tithing in 2000, excuse me, in 1999, from 1999 to 2000, my yearly salary increased almost $35,000 with no raise on my job, no promotion on my job. And $35,000 because, because a good friend of mine, Glenn Barrow, taught me about the principles of tithing. So tithing is a principle that you need to be able to do. We'll talk about that in the 70, um, 30 rule. But you need to make a plan and then work the plan. You need to find out what's your total income. Okay, and here's what I mean by your total income. We talk about pre-tax and we talk about post-tax. Okay, there's a pre-tax number. That's the number that you actually are paid times hourly rate, whatever that may be. That's a pre-tax. But the money that actually goes into your bank is what's called a post-tax. It's after taxes. That after-tax income is where a lot of us live. But you need to know that pre-tax. You need to know what percentage Uncle Sam is taking from you. You need to know what comes out in Medicaid, what comes out in Social Security. Uh, you need to understand that because those numbers matter. Those numbers really do matter. And, and for those of us who are approaching our 40s and 50s and 60s, Social Security by itself is not enough to take care of you when you are old. You cannot simply rely on a Social Security check coming at the first of the month to take care of all of your needs. It's not enough money. I don't have time to go into the social security realm, but please let me tell you, it's not enough money. Please don't bank your later years in life about getting social security. They're fooling you. You need to know how much you need to save and invest. What are your monthly expenses? What are your debt repayments? Here's a big one. What costs can you reduce? I told a man again last night that I was looking through my um, doing, you know, reconciling accounts and I saw um, a debit uh, of 407 for Xfinity. Now, Xfinity is an automatic debit. Uh, ACH just comes out every single month. But it's for whatever reason, this number came across my my um, my um, my attention a couple days ago. And it said 407, like four hundred and seven dollars for Xfinity. So I call him because I'm thinking it's a mistake. Like, why are you charging me four hundred and seven dollars for cable? So I call him and the lady says, well, you got ninety nine thousand channels. And I was like, well, I only watch like five of them. Like, take every channel except for these five off. Give me the basic, 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 basic package. She did that. After she done trimmed a whole lot of the of the fat on the cable and and the, all the other stuff, the the, the phone, I, I got a landline at my house. I haven't used that phone. I know, I know in the last 10 years, I, it, it, 
I don't even know where it is. After she trim all the fat, I go from 407 to 191. I just saved $2,500 a year by reducing cost. You'd be surprised where those little pinholes are that's causing water to come into the ship. Find out what those little pinholes are and plug them up. Find out what in your life you can reduce. And a lot of times of the stuff that we can reduce is in what's called discretionary spending. Uh, you going out to eat three, four, five, six, seven times a week. You know, all of this discretionary uh, spending um, that many of us have become accustomed to, those are those little pinholes that are allowing water to come into the ship. So you need to understand that, find out where you can reduce certain costs, okay? Um, you got 99,000 subscriptions, you got Hulu, you got Netflix, you got all of these subscriptions that you got floating around out there. And many of you will say, oh, well, it's only 15, uh, $15 a month. Netflix just recently went up to $17.99. Okay, well, these are the small foxes that spoil the vine. So you got $17 over here, you got $15 over there, you got $12.99 over here, you got $4.99 over there, you got $6.99 over here. And before you know it, you take all of your subscriptions and that's about $150 a month that you're spending on subscriptions. You gotta find out where you can reduce cost. So you need to look at your, um, your spread. I wanna talk to you a little bit now about uh, credit. Um, this is the money game, y'all. It's credit. When you understand it, oh man. When you, oh man. When you understand credit, oh man. It's a game changer. Um, it's a game changer. Credit. Now, there was a point in time in my life um, that I had horrible credit I mean it was disgusting credit it was it was just downright egregious you know my credit score was in the fives and you know I'm a young guy you know I'm 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 I'm, I'm living you know I moved out when I was 17 years old you know I got my first credit card when I was 19 you know making a little bit of money I got my own apartment I got my own car and you know, I'm just living life. I don't care about credit. Like who cares about credit? Okay. If I don't have enough, if I don't, if they deny me on the credit card, then I'll just pay for it cash. You know, it was a cash system anyway. Uh, nobody taught me about credit. Nobody taught me about this big juggernaut called credit. Now I've made a joke in saying that America is almost, you know, $30 trillion in debt and they have the audacity to ask me for my credit score. Um, but credit is what changes the game, y'all. But I wanna dispel, dispel a couple of myths. You don't have to have perfect credit. Stop striving for perfect credit. Oh, I got an 850 credit score. I got an 800 credit score. I got an 825 credit score. That's good, but watch this. Your 850 credit score is not gonna give you any better rate than my 750 credit score. I'm not striving for perfection, right? So stop striving and try to get a perfect credit score. A perfect credit score actually hurts your credit when trying to lend to. But I want you to understand what credit is. Uh, FICO, uh, Fair Isaac Corporation. Um, this particular um, FICO is one that measures credit. Now I know a lot of people out there go to Credit Karma and you got this little app that you can do to find out your credit score with Credit Karma. The problem with Credit Karma, no no knock on Credit Karma, but there's a discrepancy in your credit score of about maybe 10 to 15 points with Credit Karma. If you're going to check your credit score, if you're going to stay up on your credit score, you need to go through FICO. It's the same kind of app. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive. It's like $13 a month uh, with all of the alerts and credit monitoring and all that other good stuff. But FICO gives you an accurate depiction of your credit score uh, within two points, okay? So you need to understand your credit. 35% of your credit score is payment history. 
That's over a third of your credit score, which is just payment history. A third of your credit score, 35% of your credit score is simply payment history. It is simply paying your bills on time. That's all it is. Now, unfortunately, your lights, your um, your gas, um, your insurance, uh, you know, stuff like that, that doesn't count towards payment history. You know, you paying your light bill every month does not count towards your payment history unless you default on your lights or your gas or whatever the case may be. Okay. But 35% of your credit score is about uh, your payment history. So if you can simply get on top of your payment history and pay things on time, that will greatly help to drive your score up. Okay. That will drive your score up simply by paying bills on time. I know it may be difficult. I know life happens. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I know life happens, but 35% of your credit score is about payment history. That's a big deal. So when you understand this credit game and understand how they decipher your score, you can start to pay more attention to particular areas so that you can boost your credit score. Okay. You can boost it. 35%, 35%, 35% of your credit score is simply payment history. It's just, do you pay your bills on time? Do you pay your bills on time? Now, I want you to hear this. Credit ain't got nothing to do with your race. Credit ain't got nothing to do with where you live. Credit ain't got nothing to do with none of that. Here's what credit says when you go into a place to buy a car. Here's what the financing company is asking themselves. If I give you $20,000 to buy this vehicle, what's the likelihood that you're going to pay me back? That's what credit is. That's, that's all it is. Credit is simply how much can I trust you? If you got a very low credit score, that simply means you're not trustworthy. It just simply means you lie a lot. Okay. It simply means that you do not fulfill your obligations. It's not, it has nothing to do with anything else. When people would come into the bank and try to get home loans and car loans and, and all of the such, listen, on the other side of that computer, that computer is just analyzing risk. That computer says this guy has a 530 credit score. There's an overwhelming chance that if we give him this money, he is going to default on us. And we're not willing to take that risk on this person that has a subpar of uh, credit history. We're not willing to take that risk. So credit, credit is simply, can I trust you? So if you don't have a good credit score, listen, you can shout up and down in church and you can do all of this stuff within Christian circles all you want, but you, you, you can't be trusted because you don't pay back that which you owe. 35% of your credit score is simply how you pay your bills and paying your bills on time, paying your bills on time. That's 35%. 30% of your credit score is about the amounts that you owe. So if you have outstanding debt, like debt everywhere, you owe everybody. That's 30% of your credit score. So 30 plus 35, 65% of your credit score is about how you pay and how much you owe. Now your credit score, FICO particularly, FICO particularly takes certain um, things into consideration in amounts owed. So if you have a mortgage on your credit score, that's what's again called good debt. That's not wasted debt. If you got five cars uh, on your credit report, 30% of your credit score is talked about how much money that you owe. So if you got a whole lot of zero balances, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. 10% of your credit score is new credit. So this is why I encourage people to make sure that you do not have a lot of uh, credit cards. It's very, very, very important. Um, speaking of that, so I have two credit cards. 
I got two credit cards and only two. Both of them are American Express. I have an American Express blue card, which I use for daily purchases. Um, this gives me cash back and rewards. And then I have this one, which is not actually a credit card. It's a charge card, which is different. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this one I use for everyday purchases. When I'm going out to eat, buying something at Kroger, going to Home Depot or X, Y, and Z. I also have the, uh, the debit card. I got a debit card from my financial institution, right? So these are the only three cards that you will ever, that I, that I ever use, ever. Okay, here's the purposes of those three cards. I get a lot of credit card offers. I decline more credit card offers. I don't want more than two credit cards because it serves zero purpose for me having five different credit cards. It's going to actually hurt my credit when I have that many credit lines open. So I don't need more than two personally for me and what fits my family's need. You may be different. You may need other credit cards uh, to do that. That's fine. But just know that 10% of your credit score comes from new credit. So if you're going opening up a Kohl's credit card, a Ross, a Home Depot account, and all of these other things, those are new credit lines, right? And new credit line means that you owe more people new that the more people that you owe the more your payment history is impacted so you need to be careful about opening new credit lines 15 percent of your credit history of your credit score comes from the length of credit history so that means having credit established for a long period of time and having good payment history on those credit lines over a long period of time okay over a long period of time OK, so 15 percent of your credit score is credit length history. So that means that I don't get a credit card one year and then shut it down the next year. Right. I need to have history with that. And then 10 percent of your credit history is a credit mix. So I got a mortgage. I have uh, two credit cards. I got a shell gra uh, gas card and then I have, praise God, one last car note. All right. So that's the extent of my credit mix uh, in regards to that. So you need to understand uh, those five things. Thirty five percent of your credit score comes from payment history. Thirty percent of it comes from amount owed. Ten percent comes from new credit. Fifteen percent comes from length of credit history and ten percent comes from credit mix. So please understand that uh, when you're talking about your credit, because you need to understand the ebbs and flows of your particular monies. That's what your credit. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk to you about something that is very near and dear to my heart. OK, um, this is one of the things that I that if 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 I'm teaching um as I shared with the men last night, there are two people that you need to have on your speed dial. You need to know your banker. You need to know your banker. You need to know your banker by first name. And you need to know your insurance guy. Two people that you need to have on speed dial. Okay. Your banker and your insurance guy. One of the things that will help us to understand where we are in regards to money is the, is to um, establish a monthly budget. You know, finding out how much money do I have to the T and where is that money going? It's a budget. Um, I know you can't see this, but this is a typical budget that people have to fill out. And here's what it's got. It's got determining your monthly income and expenses. Uh, what does that look like in regards to your own personal life? Uh, determining what that is, how much money is going to credit cards, car payment, insurance, health insurance, savings and retirement, medical expenses, child support. If you have any tuition, utilities, clothing and the such. OK, that's a monthly budget. I want to share with you now this this thing called what I call the 70 30 rule. And this is how we govern our own particular finances. Um, so I've been working for 10 hours at $10 an hour. I get a paycheck and I'm not going to deal with uh, taxes right now. I'm just going to deal with a flat amount just to make it easy. 
Uh, I deal with a um, uh, 10 hours uh, at $10 an hour that gives me $100. I got my $100 paycheck in my hand. The problem with most people is that you live your life based on $100 that just came into your hand. That's not how much money you have. That's not how much money you actually have. Okay. I only have 20s here, so I'm going to play some Jedi mind tricks with you. So here's my $100. Okay. So I got a 70-30 rule. Okay. 70-30 principle. Uh, The first thing that I do is I give my 10 to God. Before I give to anybody else, before I do anything else, I give my 10 to God. I give 10% to God. So God's got $10. I know that's 20, but for sake of this illustration, it's $10, right? That $10 goes to God, okay? Right off the bat, okay? I don't even touch that. I don't even think about that. Uh, The second one that I give is I pay myself. I pay myself. I pay myself by savings accounts, uh, and investments, savings and investments. That's how I pay myself. The last person that I pay is my bills. Okay, so I got God, I got me, and I got my bills. Now, of the hundred dollars that I had uh, when I got paid, I'm actually after I do my seventy thirty. Actually, when I've done all of the splits and done them the way that I need to, I really only got $20 that I can be, uh, that I can be, that I can do certain things with. I don't have a hundred, right? I only got 20 because I gave 10 to God. I gave myself um, uh, 15% and then I put the rest of that into my bills. So what I have left over is 20 bucks, 20 out of a hundred, 20 out of a hundred, 20 out of a hundred. Now, if I got $20 for the next week, don't you think I'm going to be a little bit more cautious about where this $20 goes? I'm not just going to be willy nilly with some money because I got to wait a whole nother week, even two more weeks to get some more money. Right. Because I'm not I'm not living life on the hundred because I don't have a hundred. Now, let me tell you what this does. When I give my money to God, I'm keeping the windows of heaven open. Okay, I'm keeping the windows of heaven open. Habakkuk chapter number one says that God will put holes in your pocket so that you don't have enough. Okay, Malachi chapter three. I know many of you guys love it. Some of you guys hate it, but I will open up the windows of heaven for you and pull you out a blessing that you may not have room enough to receive. This is so that financially I am not eating my seed. So I'm keeping the windows of heaven open. Now watch this. This money does not always return financially. The blessings return in several different ways. But what I also shared is what I talked about in the beginning. You have to do more than just tithe. Tithing is great. We do that. We, We get that out of the way. We give God his because God owns everything. And it's easier to live off of the 90% that God allows us to keep than to live on the 100% that we will not give unto God. So I give to God just so that I can keep the windows of heaven open and that God continue to bless me. And then I pay myself. Now, this is an important rule. Many of you say, well, why don't you pay your bills first and then pay yourself? Because I'm working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I I am paying myself for the labor that I have committed to getting this money. So here's what I'm doing. I'm putting money in my savings account and in investments. Okay. I'll dispel a couple of myths about your savings account. Your savings account is liquid. Your savings account is not where you're going to gain wealth. You're not going to gain any money in your savings account. Please take my, please take my admonition as a former banker. You're not making any money with your savings account. You're getting a 0.001 on your savings account. Savings accounts are just emergency funds, liquid emergency funds. That's all a savings account is. I always recommend that people do that, have a savings account, have some emergency funds on on file, but you're not going to get rich. You're not going to get wealthy by putting money into a savings account. So when I pay myself, I do savings and investments. So I'm going to put money into my savings account for the liquid money. Okay. I got liquid money over there. So if my engine breaks down, if the air condition at the house breaks down, I got money that I can go and fix those things. I don't have to go throughout the whole summer with no AC because I don't have enough money to fix it. But in my investments, I am trying to gain appreciation in my investments. 
right? So I'm doing savings and I'm doing investments. I'll talk about what that investment is in just a little bit. So that's me paying myself. That's me saying, uh, Marcus, you worked hard this week. This is the fruit of your reward. Good job. Good job, man. You worked hard. You didn't stay at home with your feet kicked up playing PlayStation all day. Uh, you went to work and you earned your money. You didn't get anything for free and nobody handed you anything. Praise God. Good job. God is pleased. So I reward myself. Okay. And then after I've given to God, after I've rewarded myself, the next thing I do is honor my obligations. That's my mortgage. That's my car note. That's my light bill, my gas bill, my insurance, all of that stuff. That's my obligations. That's where the majority of my money is going to. Okay. That's where the majority of it is going to, which is why it leaves me with 20. Now, here's the thing about this, this 70, 30 rule. The more I do the 70, 30, my savings accounts and my investments start to look like this. I have nobody calling me over here for my bills because they're taken care of as well. God is pleased and allowing the windows of heaven to still be open and rain on me, my family and our well-being. I got all of these doors that are now open. I've taken care of my bills. So if I want to go get a new car, I can walk into that door, go down to whatever dealership and say, I want that car. And guess what? Not put any money down. Just give me the keys. That's because I've handled my 70, 30, my 70, 30 is in order, right? So when we understand the basic money principles about how we manage this stuff that comes into our hands, we become better at it. And as we get better at it, we create better lives for the people that we love. So when I was going through financially, I didn't have anybody that knew about finances that I could necessarily go and talk to. Um, I didn't and praise God that God sent a wonderful mentor in my life by the name of Dr. Richard Klein. You've heard me talk to talk about him a lot um, because he's just been instrumental in my life. Uh, he began to start teaching me about the biblical principles of money. So what I would tell you to do as we close this, this podcast is one, if you're struggling with money, if you're not good at it, first of all, you need to say that you're not good at money. You're not good at saving. You're not good at managing. You're not good in doing the things in which we talked about here today. You need to acknowledge that you need to acknowledge it. You need to get away from the guilt and the shame that comes along. Well, I'm not where I should be in life. Okay. Play me a violin. Okay, fine. You're not where you are right now. Now do something about it. Okay. But here's your first step. You need to talk to somebody with a successful financial history. Okay. You can't be talking to your homeboys who are just as broke as you are. If both of y'all in the pit, who going to let down the ladder? You can't talk to somebody who's in the exact same position as you are. But here's what you got to do. If you're going to talk to somebody with a successful financial history, you got to be open and honest about your financial history. I shared with the men last night, if you're banking in any financial institution, you can go into that bank and sit down with a banker, preferably a financial advisor and say this, I would like a financial review of my finances. That is given at, at that's giving, that's a complimentary thing that every bank does. I want to do a financial review of my finances, right? And you go, I don't care if your, your account is in the negative. I, it, it don't make a difference if you got $5 in the bank. You go and sit down and say, I would like a review of my financial portfolio because you need to have that information. That's free to you if you bank anywhere, anywhere. Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, uh, credit unions, they all do it. They all do it. They all do it. So you got to talk to somebody that's got some financial history. Find somebody in and around you, somebody that you know, and go tap them on the shoulder. See, what I had to come to grips with is that I did not know how to manage money. I just didn't know. It, it, it wasn't because I wasn't working. I wasn't staying at home being lazy. It, it, it wasn't that. It wasn't the fact that, okay, I just don't want to know. I just didn't know. Nobody was able to teach me these things. Nobody was able to teach me until I got around some people that had successful financial history and they were able to aim me in the right direction. Now, again, everybody, I am not a millionaire. 
I am not a millionaire. I'm not talking from somebody that is a millionaire. Uh, but I got three kids in college, three of them, three of them. One comes out this year. The other one comes out next year. Junior comes out two years from that. And then next year, faith goes in. So I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking from a place to where these particular principles work so that the family is blessed. So talk to somebody that's got a, a financial history Two, you need to develop a budget. You need to develop a budget. And here's what I would say about married couples, married couples. Y'all need to get on the same page financially. OK, out of the 54 divorce rate in the world, almost 39 percent of that 54 percent is because of money. People are splitting over money. Married couples, y'all got to be on the same page. Y'all got to be on the same page. Y'all got to work a budget. You 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 got to know what you have and what you don't have. You got to know that. And you can't beat it over each other's head when mama wants to go out to Perry's and you mad because she want to go out to an expensive steakhouse. Well, if y'all are on the same page financially, then y'all plan for those days. Y'all plan for those trips. Maybe you can't pay for a family trip all at once. But if you say, hey, mama, we want to go on a trip next year and it's going to cost three thousand dollars for the entire family to go. Here's what I think we ought to do. We ought to pay two hundred dollars a month on that particular trip that we're going to take next year so that the whole family can be blessed. Y'all got to get on the same page. I got to develop a budget. You got to take money off the table and don't argue over money. Don't argue over money. Don't argue over money. Don't argue over money. Take a particular look at your discretionary spending, your entertainment, your eating out, your shopping, sports, recreational, personal care items. T take a take a look at those discretionary items because again that's where you're going to find the, the biggest gaping holes at is in those discretionary um spending lastly or two things lastly if you have a 401k if you have a job that is um, offering a 401k uh you need to be involved in it um if you have a job that is matching your 401k you need to max whatever they're matching all right, you need to be involved in that. Okay, a 401k is an excellent vehicle. Now, it's it's I'm not going to say it's the best, but it is a very very excellent vehicle in order to grow long-term wealth or long-term riches. Um it takes a minute unless you're highly vested in 401k um over a number of decades in order to have wealth, like transferable wealth. Before 401ks and IRAs, individual retirement accounts are great, great vehicles um, to earn you some additional interest and make your money work for you. Savings account, your money's not working for you. you look at 401ks and IRAs. Now, here's lastly, and this is important to me. So I'm going to spend about five minutes on this because you need to hear this. The number one, the number one way that wealth is transferred in America, the number one way is through insurance. The number one way. Make no mistake about it. Everybody that's watching me right now, you are worth more dead than you are alive. As a person that used to be an insurance agent uh, back in 2008, um, excuse me, as a financial representative, but insurance was a part of the portfolio that I offered to my clients. Um, the standard rule is this. Now, it's probably about 12 now, but at that time it was 10%. It was 10. Whatever your annual income is, you need to have 10 times that in insurance. Uh, what I typically say to the person right now, you need to have at least a million dollars of insurance, at least, especially if you have a wife and you have a family. Because husbands, let me just share this with you. We are responsible for our wives as long as they live. If we die before our wives, we are responsible for our wives as long as they live. So... A million dollars is just a flat line policy that everybody should have. Okay. Insurance is absolutely vital because you're going to die. And right now the average cost to put somebody in the ground is $9,700 to cremate. Somebody is $2,600. That's just to put them in the ground. That $9,600, $9,700, that doesn't include opening up the grave. If you go down here to Paradise and Cullen, 
It cost nineteen hundred dollars to open up that ground. Nineteen hundred. It costs nineteen hundred dollars for them to get a a, a, um, a, a a bulldozer, whatever that thing is called, and open up the ground to put your casket in. Nineteen hundred dollars. And then you got the cost of the funeral expenses. You got the casket. You got you know all of this stuff that comes along with burying a person. Ten thousand dollars. Let's say at a fat line base, ten thousand dollars. Well, some will say, "Oh, I'm just gonna cremate my my mama, my daddy, my brother, my sister, my mom." You know, okay, fine. That's twenty. That's twenty six hundred. That's to burn them and give you an urn. And nobody wants to throw money into a hole. So now, because people don't get insurance, we gotta sell chicken dinners and fish dinners and do GoFundmes in order to put you in the ground. That is terribly selfish. How do you live a complete life 30, 40, 50, 60 years and then leave your death on the people that loved you the most and they're sitting there crying crocodile tears because you've left. You've left them a void in their heart because you're not there, but you've also now left financial strain and distress on them as they mourn your death. How selfish is that? Insurance is absolutely vital. You need to have it. It's, it's, it's not an option. It's a necessity. You need to have it. If you don't have it, you need to get it like yesterday. Okay, wherever you are, wherever you are, you need to get it. You need to have a policy that pays out when you're dead. Okay, you need to have a policy and a plan in place when you die. I have a folder. I have a blue folder that has all the insurance policies. I got insurance policies on my kids. I got insurance policy on my wife. I got an insurance policy on my mom. I got an insurance policy on myself. They're all in a little folder. If I should die, my wife goes to that folder, opens up that folder. Here's the number you call. Here's our insurance guy, Bob Smith. Shout out to you, man. Here's our insurance guy. Call him first. Call him first. Get the wheels in motion. Here's the mortgage. Here's my username, my password. Here's what you do to pay off the house immediately once I'm once I'm dead and gone. Use a portion of this money to pay it off. Here's a list of all of the bills. Here's a list of the username and passwords to get on all of these accounts. This is what you do. It's all in one folder. Cuz I'm preparing for my death. One day I'm going to die. And when I die, I don't want to leave my children and my, my wife despondent because now the major breadwinner of the home is gone. The major breadwinner is gone. So that means the salary of that major breadwinner is no longer coming into the house. The major breadwinner. That salary is gone. So now what happens to the wife and to the kids who are living in that house that you just purchased 10 years ago that's got that mortgage on it that now she can't afford by herself? Insurance is absolutely vital. It's absolutely vital. And as a pastor, I see it all too often to my despair of people dying and have no policy in place. And now the parent, now the kids and all the other people and family members have got to scrounge around to try to get this person buried. And it's just not worth it. So I want to tell you this. The quicker you get insurance, the better. OK, you need to get insurance because an insurance policy typically has a six month, some have up to a two year buffer period. So that means that if I get insurance today, I got to wait to die for two years before that insurance policy pays out. These are things that you got to know, right? So the number one transfer of wealth is, is through insurance, through insurance. So when I die, I want to transfer wealth unto my family so that my family, who is already mourning at the time, does not suffer even more because the major breadwinner has been taken out of the house. This is about understanding our finances, everybody. Listen, I'm not telling you that you're going to be rich. I'm not telling you you're going to be a millionaire. I'm not telling you any of that such stuff uh, by, by no stretch of the imagination. But I am telling you this. Um, we need to start playing checkered. I mean, chess. 
Uh, we need to get out of the checkers game. We need to start playing chess. Okay, we need to start being very strategic about uh, these dollars um, that are coming through our hands and teach your children about this stuff. Teach your children about this stuff. First of all, you learn. And no matter where you are right now, everybody, here's an encouraging word as we end. No matter where you are, no matter if your, your account is in the negative, no matter if you are way in the positive, no matter where you are, I want to encourage you, man, with money, it's never too late to learn. It's never too late to learn. You're talking to a person that went through bankruptcy and had, you know, government assistance. Okay, no matter where you are in life, it's never too late. It's never too late. But it takes courage to deal with your money. So I'm encouraging you to start taking some necessary steps. Start doing a little bit of research. Start finding out a little bit more about the money that you're working so hard for and allow that money to begin to start to work for you so that you're not the 60-year-old Walmart greeter. And if you are that person, God bless you. That's not a disparaging remark. Um, but I don't think that you work 30, 40, 50 years to retire for five years and then have to go back to work because you have to go back to work. I don't think anybody desires to do that. I think if you're going to retire, you want to enjoy those years of retirement. So it's not a disparaging remark if you are that guy. But I think if we're going to do this, we can do this right. And we can put some things in place that are going to bless us along the way. Um, because this stuff does make a difference. It does make a difference. Money does matter. It's not the most important thing, but it is a very important thing. So understand how to <clears throat> how to use your money, how to make your money work for you. Um, and, and God will be um, glorified through how we use our finances. Uh, on next week, I pray that um, this person has not um, returned, um, has not gotten back with me, but I pray to have another financial representative uh, on this side of the table to continue our talks about uh, money and particular things that you can do very, very practically um, in your life. Uh, we talk about don't try to chew the elephant all at one time. Just take one bite. If you've never started, if you've never saved money, don't try to save five hundred dollars a month. Uh, hear me when I tell you, try to save fifty dollars a month, a hundred dollars a month. If you've never saved, why are you trying to save a thousand? Don't set yourself up to fail like that. The best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. Crawl back into this race. Don't just jump in. You know, crawl back into this thing slowly but surely. And if you do this consistently, watch what a year will look like. Watch what two years will look like. Watch what three years will look like as you crawl slowly back into this race. You can get your credit fixed. It's not the end of it. OK, it's not the end of it. But just continue to drive that old beat up car until you get your credit right so that you don't get a 24 percent APR on the vehicle that you just had to have. So with that said, everybody, I want to thank you so very much for joining us here on the set of Studio B. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Share this stuff. Share this stuff. Share this stuff. Man, you guys have been greatly, greatly faithful in all that you have done uh, since we've been here on the air for the last year and a half, almost two years um, of what we've been doing here to set a Studio B. And I want to thank you so very much for your viewership and your followership. Everybody, remember, if God be for you, it's more than the entire world against you. Remember that when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. Be informed, be empowered, Studio B.